Okay, thanks very much. So the, the next call talk is by uh, Fedra Upton. She comes all the way from New Zealand, so please stay here and listen. Uh, don't go away. <laughs> so uh, Fedra, so Fedra is going to talk about really important uh, subject here, it's about all the, the workshop coupling geodynamic and surface processes. So please go. Ahead. Thank you. I didn't think about the microphone situation when I chose my dress, so I hope this will work. Um, I'm really excited about this workshop. It's kind of, as Mark said, been in the planning for about four years. Um, so it's great that it's happening now. Um, and, you know, it sort of came from CSDMS and Jai Savitsky being open to the idea of a, fo a geodynamic focus research group and then CIG being willing to um, join with this meeting. So that's great. Um, so we're going to change tech. Uh, is there feedback? I'm getting feedback. Um, yeah, so we're going to change tectonic regimes and, and scale. So my natural laboratory has been the Southern Alps of New Zealand for all my time as a geologist, geodynamicist, and now moving into surface processes. So, and, it's, and I'm going to be talking about the collisional, collisional setting within um, the Southern Alps. I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors, Peter Coons, who has also spent years looking at active tectonic belts and Southern Alps, Sam Roy, who's, who's here, and he'll take any tricky questions on his models, and Nick Richman, who's also at the University of Maine. He's a, a master's student. So, as I've ambitiously said, I'm going to look at the coupling between geodynamics and surface processes, and we're going to zoom in from the last talk. Um, I'm really going to look at the rocks, because the rocks are what are acted upon both by the tectonics and the surface processes. As I said, I'm largely going to focus on collisional settings, and these are settings with high uplift rates, high exhumation rates. Um, so we're, we're looking initially at a largely supply-limited system. The rocks at the surface, it's not covered by soil. I'm not really going to focus today on sedimentation, sediments, but sediments obviously are extremely important. That's one thing that came up in our breakout group, the, the role that sediments and the sedimentary record have in and telling us what has happened in the past. Um, so this is um, the South Island of New Zealand, and you can see this beautiful landscape. Um, and there's two, this, the, the rock has two really strong planes of weakness. One's a foliation, and one's a jointing surface that's kind of nearly perpendicular to it. And you see both of them really reflected in the, in the landscape that's, that's produced right there. But also, as it turns out, makes it quite difficult to get from that ridge down to this lake. Um, and this is a, um, it's a landslide dam lake. And if we zoom out, we see that that, that feature too is a direct product of the, of the rock properties. It's the, the foliation surface is the sliding surface on which that landslide, that landslide formed and, and dammed the lake. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about materials, earth materials and process, and I'm gonna, give a brief introduction and then talk about modeling, um, modeling the materials and the processes and trying to bring them together. And then I'm going to um, present a, a, a conceptual framework that Peter Coons and I and others have been working on for quite a while that where we're trying to really bring the geodynamics and geodynamic processes, the, the, the materials together with, with the surface processes that are acting upon, upon those materials. Okay, so as I said, we're looking at dynamic landscapes, and we want to look at the forces, geodynamics, forces that are, that are associated with deep earth processes. I mean, subduction, collision, these are the large-scale forces that are driving these processes. And then we have the geomorphology, the, the shaping of the Earth's surface, driven by atmospheric processes. And particularly in these dynamic environments that we're going to look at, we end up with quite complex competing interactions and we get these dramatic lands landscapes and we want to understand what what's driving those landscapes why they look like what they do what we can say about them so we're kind of uh, coming at it from i'm really going to today i think i'm we're going to be talking about materials material strengths and driving forces or stresses so we have constructive forces or, or strength that, that keep the rock there versus destructive forces. We have stresses 
things acting upon those, those geological materials that, that break the rock or, and allow it to be available for a surface process to act upon it. I'll probably use the word failure quite often, and what I mean by failure is breaking the rock. And failure can happen in a, in a, in a rock or a soil or anything, and, and we can have, I'll, I'm largely gonna be talking about compressive forces, but to get failure in a rock, you have to break it. So if you're pulling it apart, you have to overcome the tensile strength of that rock. If you've got a sand pile, and for, for the sand to flow down you have to overcome the frictional strength of that, of that sand. Or if, if it's a rock and you're sharing it, you have to overcome the cohesive strength of, the, of that rock. So I will use those terms or failure, but what I mean is, is we, we need, in order for to erode or transport a, a rock or a part of a rock, it has to break away from the, the bedrock that it's connected to. And that's kind of really where we're coming from with this. Um, this conceptual framework that I'm going to present to you, and also where we're trying to calculate what's holding that rock together. Why is it strong? Why isn't it strong? And what's acting upon those rocks? Why are they breaking and failing? So I've just so there's there's a variety. We've we've had most of these mentioned already today. Obviously, there's the the topography in a, in a mountain landscape, and topography can both strengthen the load, a topographic load will strengthen. The, the material, the rock mass, but the steep slopes due to the high shear stresses can weaken. So topography kind of acts as both a destructive and, and a constructive force. Um, we have the, the fluvial and, and glacial forces acting upon the landscape. Um, I couldn't find a, a picture with everything I wanted and the glacial was kind of what missed it out. But so, so the fluvial we're talking about I mean, water running over a strong rock isn't going to do anything, but it carries tools, it carries sands, gravels, et cetera, so that, and the stresses. And if it's a weak rock, if it's a shear zone, I mean, it really doesn't take much for that, those, um, for that process to, to erode. We have tectonic forces. So in the landscapes that I'm, we're looking at here, you know, the, so the Southern Alps, it's a collisional, collisional environment. The rock is constantly... Um, these are the, the GPS vectors, so the, the rock is constantly under convergent and strike slip. It's quite a bleak system. And then now and then it is hit by seismic waves, um, which, yeah, obviously we had quite a, a large earthquake a, couple, a year and a half ago, which has given us a lot of a lot to work on. Um, this this landslide here in the landscape actually occurred following a 7.1. In 1929. So, you know, why did that particular bit of rock break under those stresses rather than another? So, I'm first going to um, talk about materials and material properties and then move on to process. So, Southern Alps or the west, the west coast of the South Island has long been thought of, known for, um, you know, dramatic uplift, high erosion. It's where the, the critical wedge theory was. I've talked about in our breakup group this morning, you know, the two-sided wedge. Um, this, the Southern Alps was kind of the basis for some of those models. And so if we look at the oh, central, central South Island across kind of the classic cross-section across the Southern Alps, this is rainfall, this map, this is sediment yield. This is the, the, the central Southern Alps, you know, we have moderate to steep slopes, we have Rapid uplift and exhumation on this western side. We have quite a bit of rain at times. You know, the rainfall is five to 10 metres a year. The rocks are schist, schist along the west coast and grey wackies, and the sediment yields are some of the highest around, up, you know, greater than 2,000 tonnes per kilometre per year. And it's, yeah, we know what's happening. There's high uplift rates. The rock's not that strong. It's being eroded rapidly, and we're getting this huge sediment rate. We moved down to, to southwestland here. Again, the rainfall is at least as dramatic, but here we've got near vertical slopes. It, you know, if you look at that picture there, it looks like the ice left yesterday. Actually, it left you know, um, 10, 15,000 years ago. And the difference, of course, is the geology. The, those rocks are granites, granodiorites, and they're just too strong for fluvial processes to really influence them. And it takes ice. It takes ice to erode those rocks. 
Um, and what we see here is the steepest slopes have the lowest erosion rates, and it's because of the material properties. Um, this is this this um, uh, publication is already mentioned today. So this is just another example on a slightly smaller scale that comes from um, Huntington and Kleppis, the challenges and opportunities for research in tectonics. And of course, one of their, their big challenges is, is the topic of our workshop uh, for the next couple of days. And here they, they point out that there's these three catchments, similar erosion rates, but very different reliefs. And question, is it climate, is it rock strength, is it process? In this case, they, they say it's likely to be difference of material properties. So we have made quite a bit of progress in, in taking and looking at how material properties and material properties that are driven by tectonics um, are reflected in the landscape. And the next few slides, I'm going to talk about a largely Sam Roy's work. So what he did was modify child, which is the landscape evolution model, which is very well used. And, and so he modified it so that he could include the um, that rock strength for a variety of, of products of tectonics. So we went into the field and, and measured um, the, the cohesion of, this is the bedrock jointed grey wacky, and it's been deformed into cataclasites and gorge, uh, gouges along in, in a series of fault zones. And by looking at the properties of the rock in the field and using this hook brown, hook brown um, criteria here, could estimate the um, the cohesion of of the different different materials, and then using this relationship for the detachment, we can relate erodibility to to cohesion um, based based on field observations. The other diff the other thing that happens in in the process of of weakening driven by tectonics is a reduction in the the fractious a change in the fracture space and therefore a reduction in the grain size of the products of, of erosion. And so that's also, uh, Sam also classified that so that you get a, a grain size which is a function of the fracture spacing and, and was into the models as well. So if we just look at a couple of, the, of these models, um, this, is, this is a, that's the, this model is only, is homogeneous with just the strong, the strong rock. This model has a damage zone down the middle of it um, based on those field observations. So that the, the core of that damage zone is much, much weaker and much, much easier, more easily eroded than, than this, this model. We're looking at a map view down onto these models. The flow out look, let here, there's a simple uplift put onto the model and hopefully this will make them run. Okay, so we can see Immediately, as, as you'd expect, that there's a much a, a large difference in the in the form of the landscape as a result of the change in um, rock properties here. It's all equally erodible, and we get this kind of dendritic type pattern. Here we've got this much more erodible zone, so that erodes out more quickly, and these the, these hillsides respond. And we can look at how the sinuosity of the system changes with this um, change in material properties, uh, increase in the rate of nick point migration when you've got that weak zone. And we can look at sediment storage in, in these models as well. So the colors now represent how long a, a sediment stays in the system. Here, is, here the erosion rates are slower, the slopes, are, slopes stay quite high. Um, steep, the sediment is produced and, and moves out of the system. Here, because we get we erode that material out, we get that we get this nice um, less steep um, main valley through here, and what that ends up with this, the sediment, particularly the coarse sediment that's coming off the hill slopes, stay in the system. And in the, the amount of time that the bedrock in, in the weak zone is armored. Is actually significant, and so this zone is more easily eroded. But because of that, the slopes reduce, 
the sediments stay in there and it protects it until a big storm. And I think believe this model did have st had storms, so then the big storm might come through, wash it out, and then you'll get more rapid erosion. Um, that's it. These we've we've also taken that model. So this is taken that model and coupled it to a um, strain softening geodynamic model. So instead of imposing, we're saying this is where the weak zones are and let's look at how the landscape responds to that. We're taking a geodynamic model. This is a simple, simple collisional zone, um, it's orthogonal collision, and also a simple orographic precipitation model on top to, to feed the to feed the rain into the into the um, landscape model. So in this case, the geodynamic model produces its a strength. Well, I'll show you two. One has got no no. They both have strain softening. So this, the geodynamic model, we predict where the fault zones, where the strain localization is going to occur. We take, and where we have the fully coupled, we take that, those resultants cohesion values, convert them in the landscape model to erodibility. And so we can see how they, they feed back between the two. So the top one has the geodynamics and the landscape evolution, but it does not but it doesn't feed the erodibility back. This, this one has the erodibility feeding back. So initially they look quite similar. We see the, the streams forming down slope, but as these strain softened zones occur, develop in here, they're softened, they're weaker, they're more readily erodible. I'll just see if I can play that again. And so once these start to, oh, sorry. So many things to coordinate here. It's funny, control it by the computer, it does what you want. Control it with this, it doesn't. So, yeah, so these start similar, but you see we start to get these other weaker zones. It's much easier to erode that. So we start to focus the deformation in there. And it, but the, the water still has to, the rivers still have to head out eventually. So they just pick a couple of, these zones and, and move through. So um, we do have um, quite a, this is, this is coupled, but, but there's, there's still lots to do. And one of the things that we want to do is um, start to think more about breaking that rock. So these are, these are diffusional landscape rules. So the, the, um, the erodibility and the erosion, the landscape isn't a diffusional law, but we want to really start thinking about rather than having just a rate and a diffusional law, why is it happening? And can we say, where is, where is that rock going to break? And why is it breaking? And what are the stresses that are causing it to break? So now I want to, and there's lots of stresses to think about. So first of all, I'm going to talk a bit about topographic stresses and re the relief of, and what we can say about how Topography influences both where surface processes are happening and also where the geodynamic processes are happening. So I'm kind of going to flick back and forth between the two. Um, this is a, a, a another example from the researchers in, in tectonics, and here the authors show just they just show quite nicely how the topographic stresses are reflected in the the properties and so they've used they've modeled the topographic stresses and then they've looked at um, p wave velocity and the p wave velocity um, indicates where you've got disaggregation and fracturing and groundwater flow and so you can see that there's quite a nice relationship between the the damage and and the stresses so this is the west coast of the south island and um the alpine fault and we, there's been um, a deep fault drilling program that's been happening over the last, I don't know, eight, ten years. Um, and their aim was to sample the alpine fault at depth. But for us and for this community, it's a fantastic ex uh, opportunity to look at the interaction of the tectonics, the topography, the surface processes, 
um, for, for many reasons. So we've got a plate boundary fault, the Alpine fault here. It's um, a highly oblique fault, so, so it's got a strong component of strike slip and, and, and uplift on the hanging wall. So the tectonics are three, the, the driving forces are three dimensional. And then the, we've got the main divide back here, which is about, this is about 20 to 25 kilometers. And these peaks are three to four kilometers high. And then the, the range is cut by these, these big rivers that are basically perpendicular to the boundary. So it's a highly three dimensional system. And it's complicated, but it's great. It's great for, for the sort of questions we are answering. It, um, it made trying to decide where to put the drill hole quite complicated. So there's a couple of just things I want to tell you about the results from, from this, um, which have lots of implications for the sort of questions we're talking about. So this is the drill hole there. So one of the things that, and, and we knew that there was high heat flow in this region, but you know, when we, when we, we drilled, we drilled to, we got to about 900 meters below um, the ground surface and then we didn't actually hit the pole because we ran into technical difficulty. But by the, but it, down there we were getting, the geothermal gradient was, was, you know, over 100 degrees Celsius per kilometer, which is way high for any region that doesn't have a volcanic source. So really, um, it, was, it was hot. It was, Quite hot, and the reason it's hot, the, it's it's the tectonics. The, the main reason it's hot is because of the tectonics. These the rocks are being uplifted along the Alpine fault faster than they can cool. But in addition to that, we have a, a large a large fault here, which the damage zone associated with that fault means that the rocks and the hanging wall are highly damaged. So that we've got high permeability there, and then we have this high topography, which is giving a topographic driving force. And so the, hopefully you can see these arrows on here. So the, there's this fluid flow that's going down the hill and then up into the valley. So there's, we've got a fractured rock. We've got high, high rainfall, lots of rain. We've got a topographic driving force that's, that's driving that water down, that's picking up heat and it's, taking it up into the up into the valleys and so what we and t actually today in our breakout group someone's we were talking about thermochronology and how important that surface processes etc might be for thermochronology and that is definitely the case here and that you know you cannot put just you can't assume in the western southern alps that your that your temperature um, contours are going to track with topography, which is a common assumption. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. So your, your thermal gradient beneath the mountains is, is much lower than your thermal gradient beneath, beneath the valleys. And, and this is because of tectonics and, sur and what's happening at the surface. And both are, you can't, you can't figure out what's going on without thinking about both of them. Sorry, I've got eight minutes. So this is the same region, but in this case, we're more looking at how the topography is influencing the, the it's not the tectonics, it's influencing the structure and it's influencing where the deformation is taking place. And don't worry about steering notes unless you want to. So again, we've got the Fotoroa Valley um, and this is the Fotoroa Valley here. And what, what we were looking at is if you've got the, the, the current oblique strike slip motion that's happening on the Alpine Fault, does, it inter does the topography influence where that faulting actually takes place in the near surface? And it turns out it does. And it influences because it, um, it rotates the stress tense, it changes the stresses. And so we end up, and we can, so we end up having a strike slip fault there and a thrust fault there and another strike slip fault there and are there because that valley's there. And stresses bring me nicely to this, the, what we're calling the failure earth response model. And this is to try and use a, 
and earth to use a an approach to break to to the failure of earth material so breaking the rock that's that takes into account the strength and the stresses the strength of the rock and the stresses because basically that rock will break if the stresses overcome the strength of the material so if you're at a particular point you know you need to we we need to compute the local strength of the material look at what the stresses are that are impacting that material and if these overcome that then then we'll get then it will break and if it breaks it means that it's available to be moved from from where so in a in the landscape we have as i said we've got the slope we've got the tectonic stresses we've got slope stresses fluvial um, glacial seismic it's short term so okay so i'm going to go through some results that we've got from from this model um, at the moment where we've built it in in a geodynamic model flax 3d Flat 3D is not an open source model, but it's which is frustrating. But it's but it has what it, it has the capability to do what do what we want. Um, we're assuming that it's a completely supply limit, so that we can we're not looking at transport, we're not looking at sedimentation. As soon as something breaks, we remove it from the system, and that's a huge assumption, but it's useful and, and it's a starting point. So what we do in the model is we can sum all the stresses, um, tectonic, if we, depending on what our boundary conditions are, tectonic geomorphology, the, the, the topographic stresses, we can impose um, fluvial stresses, and I'll show you an example where we're using another model to do that. And so we've just built this quite simple two ridges in a valley, and we've, we've built it so that this slope is stable, this slope is, is at failure because it's so steep, and these two are kind of conditional. It depends on, it depends on what's happening to them. And, oh, this is, this is useful too. We can distinguish between shear and tensile failure. So we can look at where failure is occurring because it's, it's failing in shear, or because it's, it's tensile, so it's because it's being pulled apart. So these, this is a map view of, of the material properties that we've put into these into these um, couple of examples I'm going to show you. This is basically just random heterogeneity with a weak zone down the valley. And this is that, but with these weak planes add, added to the model. And we've put in um, our model, model glacier. And, and so this, this sits here, and in some models we, we can put a velocity onto it. And this is the stability field. Um, and I don't have time to go into this in any detail, but basically what we can see is which bit of the model is stable and which bit of the model, so which bit of the model is stable. And so you can, you know, you'd have to change either the stresses or the strength parameter but for any failure to ever occur and which bits are, are unstable. And so you, could, you can see like this back slope is, is stable, except that because of the loading of the glacier here and the erosion on this side, it, it does start to erode back from, from the ridge. Here we see these weak planes and they, we, they're not stable. So that when you've got the weak planes, they're the only bits on the slope that's, that's unstable. We see that the, the, the load of the glacier strengthens underneath it, but that that transition between the load and no load is actually more unstable. In these plots, red is, is unstable and, and blue is, um, is, is stable. And I have to move on, but if anyone wants to talk to me about this in more detail, feel free. Um, this is an example where we're looking at, at rock road ice velocity. So comparing a, a system where there's, there's no ice, where we've got a stationary glacier, but it's but it, so mostly it's a loading, loading, and here we we put a a, a velocity on it, so we're we're effectively simulating a, a shear, shearing of the 
sharing of that material as that ice moves along our substrate. And we see, and this is, our, this is sigma one, so this is, that's the compressive stress. And here, if, if we've just got a valley, the direction of sigma one is parallel to the slope. If we, if we load that with the ice, the direction doesn't change, but the magnitude does. If we shear along here, we can actually rotate so that the, the, the bigger stress becomes parallel to that shearing of, of the ice. Um, and I'm going to move on. Sorry. So we've got, um, yeah, there's lots of challenges. Many of these have been raised already. The time frames, obviously, long term tectonics versus what happens in an earthquake. Um, and again, long term um, slope, slow processes versus what happens in an earthquake. Um, long term climate variability versus what happens in a huge storm. Then another big issue is imposing realistic surface processes onto this onto this model. Um, and Nick Gritchman, who's one of our students at Maine, has been doing some of that with um, smooth particle hydrodynamics. So he uses smooth particle hydrodynamics to calculate the fluvial stresses. So instead of guessing the fluvial stresses, he's actually calculating them. So I'm going to show you this movie really quickly. This is a, so he's, we've built, he's built a model. This, this model has strong and weak. So the blue, blue is weak. And this is looped between firm and flak and the smooth particle hydrodynamics. And so he, he can calculate the um, velocity magnitude and, and the stresses that develop from that, from that flow and put it onto this code. And then we see where we get, where we get failure and removal of material. He's also um, done these quite, these are com not connected at all, but this is, an ex it's, well, it's connected in that it's a tool. So, you know, if you've got a river, it's really the boulders that are flowing down that river that are doing most of the work. And this, again, is a smooth particle hydrodynamic model where we're modeling one tool. But you can see the, um, the stress, the, the stresses that develop. First, you see the stress from the waterfall and then so there's, there's a stress from that, and then you see the boulder bang. So, so there's lots of implications for this, and we've just really touched on some minor ones. And many of these I didn't really have time to go into at all. But yeah, the, the topography, re, topography records, well, it, it has mechanical anisotropy, and a lot of that is recording what's happened to that rock in the past from the tectonics, from its geological history. But in general, we can say that valleys, coals, passes are weak, high points tend to be strong because they're, they're staying there. Um, stress gradients lead to erosion. Um, tectonic stress, I didn't really even talk about tectonic stresses, but, um, oh, so there's two things. One, that the tectonic stresses and strain uh, modified by ice. So I said that the ice can be stabilized. If you've got the load, it can be stabilizing. You get destabilizing effect from the velocity, from the shear velocity, or, or the margins of the ice. And the um, sort of the opposite, or not the opposite, but related to that in the other way, is that we find that glacial erosion is more efficient in the presence of tectonic strain. Because when you've got tectonic strain, that, that rock is already sort of halfway to, or part of the way to breaking. So you put whatever your driver is on top, it's easier for that driver to break that rock if it's already strained. Poor pressure is important. It was mentioned in the last talk and that can be incorporated into this. Any questions? Okay. So my question has to do with sort of how you use observations of rock strength in models. And I wanted, I think, I think you've 
um, we discussed in our breakout group as well as you sort of described in your talk how that's sort of a, a material observable property that in many ways is a, a link between geodynamic and geomorphic models. But I think going from field observations to actually implementing that in a model is, is not necessarily straightforward. And so I wanted to see if you could comment on sort of some of the challenges that you guys faced as you've been doing this, as well as sort of any lessons you have from that. It, it is a challenge. Um, I guess this, the, the topography that we see is a constraint in, yeah, I mean, I, I think about cohesion and that sort of strength, and I guess Sam would be the better person to talk to about how you can, that relates to an erodibility. But you know, we, in an actively deforming landscape where you know you have these seismic events, and, or even where you don't, you, the, the slopes that you see and the, and the topography that you have is a constraint. It tells you how, how strong that rock has to be. And I guess it, it tells you something about the erodibility too, but I, yeah, how you get a number for that, um, I can't answer. <laughs> Hi, uh, Rolf Alto from the University of Exeter. Um, I think the talk was covered an awful lot. I just wanted to actually focus in on something I found really intriguing. Uh, when you were comparing the formation of drainage networks and this being uniform strength versus uh, the weak trough versus strong sides, uh, you had these very interesting deposits. You're looking at particle resonance time. Uh, and you had these, I guess you term them alluvial fans and coarse materials that deposited in these valleys and actually then took a much longer residence time than the rest of the landscape and they also protected the underlying weak bedrock. Is this uh, modeled within child? Um, yeah, Sam's right behind you and he did it. <laughs> but yes, it, it was done within child, yeah, modified I, child. Anyway, I just thought it was really quite fascinating. I've seen these sorts of things and I was also thinking in terms of the previous uh, talk, uh, I was curious to know how distributions of you know gravel along the, uh, the normal fault would, would rather than spreading out across the basin that kind of detail would uh, would probably have some impact on basin end volume and response to faulting it's very cool thank you So I'm not actually going to answer your question. I'm going to ask a different one, <laughs> but I'm happy to talk about it more. So this is really cool because this is trying to get a physical interpretation of what K might mean, right? Looking at the, at the rocks themselves. And so in this case, you're indexing um, damage strength on, on being at failure. But there's a lot of damage that can grow subcritically, right? When you're not at failure and that has a time scale to it. Do you think that's a time scale we should worry about or do you think it's fast enough? relative to landscape in this case? Uh, uh, no, I think, I mean, time scales is, this, I think the time scales are important and I think, yes, there, it, well, actually one of the, so in a, in a mountain belt, like the damage zone I talked about in the Alpine Fault, you know, I just talked about damage and that it's caused by the tectonic stresses and the seismicity, but at the same time, you've got healing. So, so you can actually bring a whole component of chemistry into there because, you know, we've got hot fluids, we've got lots of circulation. So some of those fractures, on, even on a seismic cycle, are going to heal. And, and we see them. We, we see those fractures in the drill hole where you've got quartz and calcite. So, yeah, there's, there's a, there'll be some critical stuff that will be time to, time, the time frame, and then there'll be other processes that are either enhancing or slowing down. So we're going to thank Fidra again. Uh, uh, there, there is uh, a break now, so there's coffee in the next room. Find it.
people outside and everybody smells coffee so and and uh, i have a a salmon for uh, michael barry yeah 